Welcome, Darkest Dungeon 2 Travelers, to another entry into our Darkest Dungeon 2 guide set. Today, we're doing a beginner's guide to try to help you get familiar with different systems in the game, different concepts, and overall give you a brief intro into all the wonderful things you're going to experience in this dark, hellish... You're going to enjoy it. It's going to be fun. Let's get started. Let's start nice and easy with profiles. The profile system is there in case you would like to restart the meta progression. If you're wondering if there's an advantage to having multiple profiles, the answer is no. It really only exists if you would like to redo the meta progression, see maybe what it felt like in the beginning before you became a seasoned veteran of the game. Now let's take a look at Confessions. Confessions in their simplest form are a run through the game of Darkest Dungeon 2. Confessions are basically you deciding which final boss you would like to fight. So if you select Denial, you know you're going to fight the Denial boss at the end, no matter what. Now. The road to get there will always be different, but each of these confessions as you unlock them are essentially the final boss you're going to fight. One last thing to take note of is that denial confession is meant to be the easiest confession. So really good when you're trying to learn the game and you're a new player, but as you unlock the others, you should expect them to get progressively more difficult as you go down the list. Next, let's talk about the crossroads, better known as a character selection screen. The crossroads is where you are going to put together your team that you intend to take into the muck, mud, and darkness of Darkest Dungeon 2. Now, if this is your first time seeing the screen or your first couple times, it's gonna look a little incomplete, and that's because this screen needs to be unlocked throughout the game as you play. You can see there are other characters that will eventually be unlocked, but additionally, there will be new paths to play, which are basically different styles for each character, and you will also unlock their full skill set as you continue to play through the game. One of my favorite parts about this progression system is this concept will allow you to try and experiment with a lot of different styles and a lot of different characters and it'll really help you learn them at a slower pace instead of just dumping all of the characters and all of the skills on you at the same time. It's a really nice smooth way to get from I don't know what's going on to oh let me try this new idea or this new style I want for this character and see how it fits with these other characters. So work with what you got for now. Just keep in mind you'll have all kinds of new ways to play and new things you'll be able to do as you unlock the different pieces of each character and the different characters available for play. And real quick, if you're wondering how you unlock them, you're going to find shrines. A shrine is a location on the map that will allow you to unlock one new skill on one of your characters. So choose a character you would like to add a skill to, and then it will take you into either a story element or into a mini little story event that I don't want to spoil by explaining too much. Just you'll do a story event and then you'll unlock a skill. It's actually a really neat way to introduce the character to new skills and to story at the same time for each of the characters in Darkest Dungeon 2. Speaking of characters, let's take a quick look at the character screen so you know what you're looking at. At the top, you'll see there's a navigation menu. This is how you see the different screens of your character. So here is the relationship screen, your combat skills, and this is where you can toggle and change them. Next, we have conditions, which is basically anything affecting your hero. So say you ate some food at the end that gave you dodge chance, it would show up here in conditions. Then you have hero goals. So Audrey needs to enter the sprawl and you receive a candle reward. And then if you're carrying any memories with you, they would be listed at the bottom here. Last but not least, if you have a pet, your pet would show up here. Now, if we take a glance at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the resistances to all the different things that can affect you throughout the course of a game, followed by your hero's health, your hero's stress, and your hero's speed. If you have any trinkets equipped, they will show up here. And this is also where when you find them, you open your inventory by pressing I. You would drag them from the inventory onto the character. And then we have quirks. So if we look at the quirks, this is basically one negative and one positive. You can have up to three of each of these. So you'll want to keep track of these so you understand how they're affecting your character and how you may need to adapt or maybe repair that character at a hospital later. Then at the top, we have our path. Just in case you want to remind yourself of the impact of the path or you forgot. And this is a Wanderer, so she's just a base character, but that means she will get a bonus candle if she reaches the second in. One neat little tidbit is if you click the pencil, you can actually rename all of your heroes. So if you want to rename them to something that means a lot to you or something that just helps you escape to somewhere far away, this is where you would do that. Now let's put those characters into a team. Let's jump into positioning. At the core of Darkest Dungeon 2 is the team positioning mechanic, similar to its predecessor. Whenever you're watching gameplay videos, a guide, or maybe a live stream on Twitch, like mine, 
you will often hear things like position one or position three for a character, which is basically speaking to their alignment. One, two, three, four. This is basically the alignment that the characters will show up in in battle. So the man-at-arms will be in the one position, the two position for the highwaymen, so on and so forth. So whenever you see someone talking about one, two, three position, this is what they mean. One neat little Easter egg in the game is that some team compositions come with a nickname. So this one is the Unusual Suspects. You can try different variations and combinations to try to find all the different names in the game. And this leads us right into the Pips of Power. <laughs> uh, a common hang-up for many new players in Darkest Dungeon 2 and in Darkest Dungeon 1 is where do I put my characters and how do I know they will be good there? This is where the Pips of Power come into play. These are the Pips of Power. The left side is your character, the right side is the enemies. This is a direct correlation to how the battlefield looks, with these being the four enemy positions and these being your four hero positions. It's not too difficult to understand once you understand the basic premise that the brighter the pip, the better your character will perform in that position based on the skills that character has selected. So you can see as you deselect and reselect skills, the pips will re-highlight in different variations to show you how your character's performance will change in that position based on what you've selected. Additionally, looking at the right side, this is how good your character will be at killing the enemy position. This can act as a very natural guide for you. You can use the positioning to make sure someone on your team can handle one of every position on the enemy team, or maybe you just really want to emphasize the ability to kill a certain position based on a boss you're going to fight or a layer you intend to take down, whatever the case may be. This can give you some insight into what your team will be able to accomplish based on which pips you have highlighted on the enemy side. You can also see the pips on any skill you highlight. So if we highlight Crush, you can see the man-at-arms can do this skill in the one and the two position, and it can hit the one, two, or three position on the enemy side. This again can be a wonderful guide to help you find a skill to hit a certain position. Like maybe you're like, oh man, this boss is really gonna need me to be able to hit the four position. So you can take on skills that will allow you to do that. The pips will also show up in combat. If you hover over a skill, it will show you where it can be used and where it can do damage. And if you open the character screen by pressing C, you will also see the pips in the upper left, same as we did in the team selection screen. One last note about the pips is they are merely a guide. They're not an all-encompassing, if I fill these in perfectly, everything will be fine. As you grow your knowledge of the game and understand different fights and different interactions, you're going to take teams that you know work and skills that you know you either like to use or you know are very effective with the team that you have. Next, let's take a look at paths, because these are a great way to diversify the way you play each character in the game. Keep in mind that in the beginning, you will only have Wanderer as a path. And this is the path that basically gives you more candles to allow you to unlock more paths later. Then, when you've acquired enough candles and done all of your unlocks, you will have three paths for every character that each has its own distinctive style that they bring to that character's skill set. Let's take a quick look at the Vestal. If you look at her, she has three paths, Confessor, Chaplain, and Seraph. And you can see each path will tell you the idea behind it, the impact it has on the character, and which skills will be affected by selecting this path. If the path is to your liking, select it, and then you can go back and take a peek at the skills and see how they changed based on the path you selected. Now, there's far too many choices and far too many options to go through all of them in a tutorial video like this. However, I would just encourage you to try new things. This is your chance to be creative, diversify the way you approach the game, and just experience characters in different roles and different capacities than maybe you're used to. Now, this brings us to the Altar of Hope. Now, you know those paths we just talked about? The Altar of Hope is where you go to unlock them. And not just that, it's also where you go to unlock in items, trinkets, a whole bevy of items to help you along your journey. This is the Darkest Dungeon 2 meta progression. The way to advance said progression is to acquire candles along your journey, and then at the beginning of each new run, you will spend those candles as you see fit on a variety of different items that you decide to unlock. So if we take a look at each category, the Intrepid Coast is where you go to improve your cart, and resourcefulness gives you different resources during different moments in the game. Like for example, arriving at the inn, wealth will give you an additional 12 relics and 15 baubles just for arriving. Renown can be a good one to save for last because it's skins for your stagecoach, which don't add any benefit other than looking good, which if that's your priority, then by all means, have fun. I'm not here to stop you. Finally, we have the Infernal Flame. The Infernal Flame is an advanced way to play the game not recommended for new players, it permanently sets your flame to one. 
which is a much more difficult way to play the game, but something you can do to challenge yourself in the future, or if you're just feeling incredibly brave and want to farm hope with definitely not a huge chance of being destroyed, then yeah, you can, you can do that too. But in all seriousness, definitely recommended for advanced players. Now that we've enjoyed our lovely little journey down the Intrepid Coast, let's take a look at the working fields. This is how you unlock the different items in the game. Trinkets, combat items, stagecoach items, and inn items, respectively. Inn items are exactly what they sound like, an item you can use once you reach an inn. Stagecoach items are items that you attach to the stagecoach that have different benefits, such as scouting or more inventory space. Combat items are going to be items that are more active, think like a grenade or a bandage, basically an on-use item that each hero can carry. And trinkets are going to be items that you can give to your heroes that have a wide variety of benefits they can take advantage of. Now, there's going to be some variety in what players decide to do here. For me, I like in items because I like the ability to maintain the relationship system, which we will get to later. But some people like trinkets, combat items, things that they feel like will be more active throughout the course of a run. So it's really going to be your decision on what you would like to prioritize. In other words, there's more than one right answer and a lot of different ways to be correct here. One little side note, anything you unlock on this page, you get to take with you on the run you're about to do. Now that we're finished working in the fields, let's go to the Living City. This is where you unlock and enhance the different heroes of Darkest Dungeon 2. Now, this is a pretty robust page, so we're not going to go through all the stats unlockable here. However, I will highlight that this is how you unlock the different paths for the different heroes. Also, this is how you will unlock the rest of the heroes as you go through the course of the game. I personally prefer to unlock the heroes first so I can see what's in the entire lineup of heroes before I go on a run. I feel it gives me more variety and more chances to try new ideas. But it's really your choice. If you just really love the Highwaymen and you know you're going to play them a lot, you can enhance the Highwaymen a whole bunch by investing your candles here. Something to take note of here, the Bounty Hunter class. When you're on the character selection screen, you'll notice that the Bounty Hunter class does not show up, but it does show up here as an unlock. That's because the Bounty Hunter class is a hireable mercenary only able to be added to your team at an inn. So if you pop into an inn and you see this little banner hanging here, you click it and then you can add the Bounty Hunter to your team. He does charge you four candles, which will be subtracted at the end of your run, and he replaces one of your characters. This is only temporary, however. So after you do your next area, let's say you're going to the Tangle next. When you're done, you'll come back to the next inn and swap the Bounty Hunter back for whoever you replaced him with. Remember, you can only have one Bounty Hunter per run, so enjoy him while you can. If you're wondering why you would use the Bounty Hunter, it's because he's pretty strong. He's a good character, he could help you do certain bosses that maybe your current team lineup couldn't do, and all around it's almost always a benefit to hire him. Unless you're really happy with your team composition, then you can just stay as is. You don't have to hire him, you can just let him hang out at the inn, have a few drinks, and go along his merry way. So after our lovely journey into the living city, now we hop into the Timeless Void, which sounds awesome and not scary at all. Oh, okay, moving on. The Timeless Void is basically the memories mechanic. This only applies after defeating a confession boss. So the way it works is you defeat a confession boss, you come back to the Altar of Hope, and you can use candles, if you desire, to carry over certain benefits for heroes who were a part of the victory. And last but not least, we have the Recollection, which is basically a compendium of all of the things you've unlocked throughout your journeys in Darkest Dungeon 2. Now, if you're wondering how you unlock all this, it's with the candles that you've been acquiring throughout the course of your runs. You do not have to have enough candles to fill an entire section. So you can see we have one candle. I can invest it in Journey and get a little bit closer to scavenging if I put it there. And it's as simple as a click. I click Journey, and there it goes. Our candle was invested, and we're a little bit closer to unlocking the next pip. Whew, we got through the Altar of Hope. You know what we could all use now? A little respite. Let's pop into an inn and talk about all the benefits of visiting one. The inn basically acts as a sanctuary between routes on your way to the mountain. If you hover your mouse in the upper left, you can see all the benefits that this particular inn provides. Now, the Torch in the Crown is always your first inn, but other inns in the future will have some variety. Now, if we direct our eyes to the bottom left of the screen, there is a navigation menu that will help you take advantage of everything the inn has to offer. First up is the travel log. This will give you a list of notable events you have experienced throughout your run. Then we have the End Expedition button. So if you just want to collect your candles and go, because maybe you're feeling like this is as far as you can get or want to get, you can do that here. Next, we have the Provisioner, which sells all manner of things from stagecoach items to combat items to anything you might need. This is basically a place for you to spend your baubles and your relics that you've gathered throughout your run. And now that you've done a little shopping, it's time to use those items. 
You can click in the upper right to navigate the menu, same as your normal inventory menu. We are going to want to make sure we use our in items before we leave. These are items that are going to affect the characters in different ways. For example, the Soothing Poultice will give one of the characters 25% fire resistance. All you have to do is drag it onto a character and you will have that buff until you reach the next in. And if you ever hover over an item and you're not sure what it means, see this one says plus 40%, just open your character screen with C and you can look at that little handy resistance section at the bottom again to see that this is move resist. Now note, not all items are 100% positive. For example, if you eat the slime mold, it does give you 10% health, but it also has a 5% chance to give you a disease. I mean, it is slime mold food. And occasionally, some of the items may give you a negative quirk. You may say, here, dismiss, drink this, and he may say, I'm swearing off alcohol forever. Or maybe he even falls in love with it. There's a lot of interactions that can happen, so just be ready for anything, basically. One last thing to note on in items, some say one target, like the ceremonial drum, but some will say two targets, and all you have to do is highlight two people that you want to match it up with. Now, if that item has a relationship effect, you may want to open the character screen and peek at relationships first so that you can see maybe one of them's close to being a real high number or maybe one of them's really low and you could prevent or cause a relationship to be impacted by your decision. Next up is the definitely doesn't want to stab you mastery trainer. This is where you use the mastery points you've acquired along the way to level up your skills. Note, each skill can only be leveled up one time, so once you've leveled it, you're good to go. And it's nice and easy, just hold down the mouse button and you'll level up the skill. Next up we have the Wainwright, which is how you equip your cart. The first slot is for a trophy, which you will acquire from defeating a layer boss. The following four slots are for equipment that you may have found or purchased along the way. And the final slot is for pets. You'll notice that these are still locked because this is a profile that has not unlocked these yet in the Altar of Hope. This is also where you can take an opportunity to repair your cart with baubles if it has sustained damage throughout the course of your journey thus far. Also something neat, the cart can also be renamed so that it fits your style and is maybe less of a potato. And lastly, we will have to select our route. You will traditionally have two options, occasionally a third option known as the sluice will show up. If you see the sluice, know that it is a bonus option. It's just a way to go gather more materials and supplies, but it won't count as one of the routes on your way to the mountain. Now, each respective area will have a goal that you can achieve. This one says avoid the hoarder. So if you avoid the hoarder, you will receive the reward listed underneath. And as you get more and more used to the game, you will learn which layer boss you will see in each area. For example, the sprawl has the librarian, which you can tell because he left you this nice little stack of books here. That's really it. You've finished all your time at the end. It's time to make your selection and hit the road. Whoa, 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 whoa. One second there. Did we forget to talk about relationships? Let's take a quick peek at that before we go. Now you can see your relationship status at any time by pressing C. This can be done in the inn or basically at any point during the game. You click the icon in the upper left, and this is your relationship screen. Now you're going to hover your mouse over a character, and it'll show you your chance at a negative relationship and your chance at a positive relationship. Now, since you're at the first inn, you can see that this inn provides a debuff both directions, most likely preventing you from being able to get a negative or positive relationship after the first inn. However, at this point, you could start saving up items during the course of your run, either in items or items to attach to your cart that can impact your ability to get a positive relationship in the future. So, if you're able to do so, when you get to the mission launch screen, you will see that there is a mystery box in the upper right of the screen. Click the box and it will tell you whether or not you got a positive or negative relationship on the two characters. So what does that mean? Well, it means that two skills, one on each character, will now have a positive impact on the other character. So for example, every time our highwayman uses Wicked Slice, they will heal one stress on the man at arms. Now conversely, had this been negative, it would probably cause one stress on the character, or it could be something different. It really depends. All you have to do is hover over the skills and you'll see what the impact is. So that's the basics of it. You spend the run cultivating your relationship and then you get the reward or the penalty depending on how things go. I do wanna mention that these interactions can also occur at different moments in the game. Here's an example. In this scenario, our team is trying to decide whether or not they should tackle the creature den. So if you choose someone to make the decision, Everyone that agrees with them will get positive relationship points, and everyone who disagrees with them will get negative. It's a nice little system that when cultivated could be a great advantage, and when ignored and set aside could definitely cause you some strife in the future. Speaking of possible strife, how about we hop into that creature den? The creature dens are going to be more difficult than your traditional encounters. They have two waves of enemies that can have pretty challenging skill sets to deal with. Now, while I would love to walk you through all of the solutions for all of these, I think it's best left for you to deal with the spiders on your own or leave a comment letting me know that you would like a guide about these. 
The best advice I could give you, though, is to use all of your items. Don't save anything. These can be difficult fights, and you don't want your run to end because you were saving everything for the end. And try to remind yourself, and not forget like I often do, that there is still a second wave after you finish the first four enemies. After you reign triumphant over the spiders, you will see you are rewarded with a bulbous venom gland. This is a deliverable that you must take to the inn. Once delivered, you will be given a discount on trinkets at that inn and one mastery point. This is in addition to the mastery point that you also received by completing the creature den. It's worth noting that the item you deliver will be different based on the creature den you completed. So if you're curious what the item you have will give you, all you have to do is hover your mouse over it and you'll know what you'll get if you make it to the next inn. It was a lot of work and took you a lot of effort, but you were definitely rewarded with some pretty worthy prizes. Speaking of potential worthy prizes, let's hop into a lair. Layers are arguably the most difficult encounter you will experience in the game outside of the confession bosses. Which is fitting because you do need to do a layer at some point during your run to obtain a trophy in order to fight the confession boss at the end of your run. So as we start, you can look at the upper left of the screen and you will see three skulls. Those represent the three phases of the fight, with the first two being waves of enemies and the third one being the final boss. In between each phase, you will have the opportunity to take your loot and leave. So, if a phase goes well, you can continue on, but if it's going poorly, you can take what you've won so far and move on. Just remember, at some point, if you want to fight the final confession boss, you will have to obtain a trophy by defeating a layer boss. However, you don't have to do it now. If you're not feeling strong enough, you could always try in the next area, because one trophy is all you need. Now, that certainly doesn't mean that you can't do more than one layer, but that's really going to be player choice. And whether or not you're willing to put yourself through that level of stress. Speaking of stress... Let's talk about it, shall we? Stress is exactly what it sounds like. It's your character's current mental state as they go through the perils of the darkest dungeon journey. The more stressed out they become, the more likely they are to lash out at their teammates. This will cause negative impacts on their relationships, hurting your ability to get positive relationships while contributing towards the possibility of a negative one. Now, if you're in the unfortunate situation that you hit 10 out of 10 stress, your character will experience what's known as a meltdown. A meltdown will cause a huge negative relationship hit with the entire team, and it will take away almost all of your hit points on that character. The good news is there are ways to manage your stress. The ideal way is to basically hit the reset button every time you arrive at an inn, using any inn items you've acquired along the way, and maybe purchasing some from the provisioner to help remove as much stress as possible before you start the next leg of your trip. There are also trinkets that can help circumvent this problem by giving you more stress resistance, and there's Laudanum, which will remove one stress on a character, and also cures Horror, which is a skill that some enemies use that is basically a stress over time skill. When you first start playing the game, dealing with your stress is going to seem insurmountable, but I promise you, as you unlock more items in the Altar of Hope, it will become easier and easier over time as you have more tools to deal with the problem. Alright, now let's talk about a mechanic that is literally life and death, the Death's Door mechanic. Death's Door is a state that you or an enemy are put at when you have no remaining hit points. In order to see the death resistance for an enemy, you hover your mouse over them, and you will see in the bottom right of the screen this character has 25 death resist. Which means they have a 75% chance of dying if you hit them when they no longer have any hit points remaining. This will also happen if you have something like poison or a damage over time effect on them. When it ticks, it will do a death door check as well. Now, not every enemy has death resist, so some of them will simply die when you deplete all of their hit points. So at one hit point, this character has no chance of dying. Let's go ahead and hit him anyway, and you'll see he moves to death's door, which means our next attack will have the ability to kill him. And not only that, he now has debuffs of minus three speed, and he is weakened, so 50% less damage. These are the side effects of him hitting death's door. Now, if we jump ahead a little, you can see this is where we will take our attempt at killing them. And good, we got him. So... Basically, we had a 75% chance and we got it. Had they resisted, they would have still had 0 HP and the fight would have continued and you would have had to try again. However, each time they resist the death blow, their resistance will drop lower and lower and lower. Now, these same rules apply to the player. So if you are in death's door and the enemy keeps hitting you, your percentage will get lower and lower. So here you can see the man at arms has 66% death blow resist. If he's on death's door, that's his odds of survival the first time he gets hit. Now, it's worth noting... All you have to do is heal 1 HP. You will be removed from death's door. 
and you have no chance of dying. So all you have to do is make sure you have situations where you can give your character 1 HP through an item or a heal so that you prevent them even going through the 66% chance of dying. It's also worth noting that this 66% is for illustrative purposes. There will be other ways to increase your death blow resist through the Altar of Hope, a Trinket, etc. And since I haven't mentioned it up to this point, it's probably a good time to mention that if you lose a character while on death's door, they are dead and gone for the rest of the run. However, if you do manage to make it to the next inn, you can refill that slot with another character. That's if and only if you have at least one more character unlocked in the Altar of Hope. Okay, so I think we've had enough of stress and dying. How about we grab our things, hop in that stagecoach, and hit the road? After all, the stagecoach will be with us on our journey and on every journey, so it's important that we take good care of her. Make sure you're adding your upgrades, like a trophy when you finish a layer, or any items you find that you can attach to it when you're at the Wainwright in the inn, and even something as simple as grabbing a pet to bring along with you. Which, by the way, pets do come with benefits. Make sure you check them out to see which one you'd like to take on your journey as you unlock them in the Altar of Hope. Also, let's not forget to take care of our cart. Otherwise, you're going to be greeted with a road fight that you may not like. When you get to the inn, go ahead and go to the Wainwright and get that repaired. And then, of course, let us not forget about hope. As you make your way through Darkest Dungeon 2, the flame is meant to be your guide. The more flame you have, the more benefits it will imbue upon you. In turn, the darker it becomes, the more negative impact you may experience. At any given time, you can see how the torch is affecting you by simply hovering your mouse over the torch, whether on the road or in a fight, and it will tell you exactly the benefits and or drawbacks your current light level has. But don't fret, there are ways to increase your light level, such as coming across the desperate few and choosing one of the options that gives you more torch, Unless maybe you want more loot and you want to give up Torch. It's really your choice and your risk. There's also an item known as the Glimmer of Hope. This is an item that you can buy at the Provisioner or find along the way. All you have to do is equip it on a character, then you can use it in combat to increase your light level. And while that all sounds fine and good, there are things that can affect it negatively as well. Let's talk about the Loathing. The Loathing Whispers, as it's called, is a mechanic that builds up over the course of your run. This can be seen in the upper right of the screen. It has negative effects like making your flame drain more quickly, and also could give the enemy an advantage in your next fight. You can avoid it by not hitting the tiers that you come across on the road, which are denoted by the blue icons you see on the map, or by completing fights that are either resistance encounters, cultist encounters, a creature den, or a lair. It's also important to note that if you max out your loathing, the mountain shudders. This causes your confession boss to get a plus 10% max HP increase, and your flame will be reduced by 10. So this is definitely something you want to avoid at all costs. How do you avoid it, you might ask? Well, scouting is a great place to start. Every time you enter a new region, there is an opportunity for you to scout. This happens automatically when you enter the region. It's basically just random luck what you're able to scout in that location. However, that doesn't mean you have no control. You can equip things like trinkets to increase your scouting chance. Some trinkets even make it so you have a 100% chance to scout specific locations. Some characters are even adept scouts in certain zones of the game because of the quirks that they have. And the absolute best way to do it is to find a watchtower. The watchtower has a 100% chance to scout every remaining location on the map. So it's important to keep in mind that scouting will give you some level of control over the path that you take. Whether you're looking for a less or more difficult path, or maybe just looking for a specific location, adding scouting chance will allow you to remove some of the variance in finding those things. And last but not least, let's talk about shortcuts. And no, unfortunately, it's not what it sounds like. Shortcuts are just really useful tools in the game to help you quick reference information you may need. For example, pressing Alt while hovering over an enemy will show you all of the skills you've learned about them so far. We can also use the information we learned about the pips of power to take advantage of what we see here. It's just a quick reference to help you decide how you want to approach an enemy and how you may manipulate the battlefield to your advantage. You can also do the same thing on your character, just in case you want to remind yourself of the skills, check resistances, whatever the case may be. Another one of my favorites is pressing H to pull up the token glossary. You can see how quick referencing this, I mean it really speaks for itself how helpful this will be. Another couple of nice ones are pressing M for your map, I for your inventory, or Z to open up the details about your stagecoach. And you know what? That about does it. That is our beginner's guide on Darkest Dungeon 2. If I might, I'd love to leave you with a little bit of encouragement. Darkest Dungeon and Darkest Dungeon 2 are notoriously difficult games. There's a reason that when you first open the game, there's a warning. The games are meant to be hard. That doesn't mean you won't have fun. 
enjoy the ride, know that you're going to experience triumphs, downfalls, and it's all about the experience. Darkest Dungeon, at its core, is about overcoming adversity and feeling that sense of accomplishment when you put it all together. And you know what? Now you have this guide to come back to anytime you need to. That said, there's no guide that can be all-encompassing for beginners. So if you have something you would like to be further elaborated upon or ideas you would like to see more videos on, drop them in the comments. I'd love to hear the ideas you have and maybe they'll pop up in a future video. And as always, if you're a part of the community and you have tips, tricks, ideas you want to share, there's lots of new people out there. That's why they're here. So if you're a veteran with something to share, drop it in the comments as well. Let's help each other. That's how we're going to get through this together. The road is tough, but it's easier with friends. I've been Nomak. You have been beautiful. If you got what you wanted, press that like. If you want more, subscribe if you might. Until next time, good day and good night.